Now, wait a minute. You listen to this. Hello again, folks. Thanks for joining the Laurel and Hardy Blogcast once again. I'm Patrick Vasey, the author of the Laurel and Hardy Blog, and welcome to Episode 5. And I've got another jam-packed show lined up for you. Not only will we be looking at the next two films in the Laurel and Hardy chronology, but we'll also be taking a personal look at the man who was ultimately responsible for bringing Stan and Babe together, the boss himself, Hal Roach. And to do this, this time I've decided to invite not one, but two special guests to join us. Oh, that's silly. Who ever heard of anybody doing that? Our first guest, coming up in a moment, is a man who interviewed Hal Roach a number of times. He even lived in Mr. Roach's home for a while. He's an author, actor, director and producer, and his name is Craig Kalman. And coming up in a little later in the programme, I'll also be talking to an award-winning documentary filmmaker who has news of a forthcoming documentary on Hal Roach, and his name is James Forsher. So, as we've got so much to pack in today, I'm going to cut this preamble short and we'll head straight over to Los Angeles, California for the first of today's guests. It's now time to meet today's special guest, and with us for episode 5, all the way from Los Angeles, California, is a lifelong Laurel and Hardy fan, who also just happens to be an actor, producer, and director as well. His name is likely familiar to many Laurel and Hardy fans for another reason, though, as he is also the author of 100 Years of Brodies with Hal Roach, The Jaunty Journeys of a Hollywood Motion Picture and Television Pioneer. And his name is Craig Kalman. Craig, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy Blogcast. Thank you, Patrick, very much. I'm delighted to be here. It's lovely to have you, sir. Absolutely lovely to have you. So, uh, as we've said, we're going to cover today um, a couple of films. We've got Sailors Beware from 1927, and we're also going to be looking at Now I'll Tell One, the Charlie Chase short that Stan and Babe appeared in, um, albeit briefly. Um, But before that, before we get into it properly, I always like to ask my guests um, about your own Laurel and Hardy backstory. Um, So could you give us some ideas how you actually discovered them, what your earliest memories of them are? Oh, sure. I will be happy to. Well, I grew up in San Diego, California. That's the city for the south in California in the 60s, early 60s. Now, I know a uh, a lot of Laurel and Hardy fans were exposed to Laurel and Hardy shorts on television, but I did not see them. I saw Fractured Flickers, and they would play the Marx Brothers, W.C. Fields, but I did not see my first Laurel and Hardy film until, and I remember it was December 1968, when I was 15 years old. I turned on the TV one afternoon, and there was, well, I had missed the opening credits. I didn't even know what the title was, but it was Saps at Sea. Okay. And I was delighted by it. I had never seen Laurel and Hardy until the age of 15. But from that moment, I was hooked. Now, I had a, an 8 millimeter movie camera. And my English teacher, bless her heart, Mrs. Sprungman, I remember her name. I was very bored with whatever we were studying, studying in English class. And she came up with the idea. She knew I liked to make movies film around with my camera. She said, why don't you write a script and your project will be making a little film? Well, we had two kids in the class, Richard and Lloyd. One was fat and the other was skinny and they were always goofing around, horsing around. They were like a natural comedy team. I just thought, hey guys, let's make a Laurel and Hardy style comedy, which we did. I played Dr. Finlayson. (laughs) <laughs> we kind of did a uh, a mimicry of, of the Finlayson doctor scene in Saps at Sea. And then we expanded. We brought Martians in. We had, we filmed all over San Diego. It was so much fun. It turned out to be a 20-minute short. We showed it in the auditorium for the entire school. The sad thing is it somehow vanished. It's so sad because little did I know I had no idea I'd ever be meeting Hal Roach and everything else that would happen, that I'd become a professional actor. I was a 15-year-old kid just having fun. Not only did I make this high school comedy with the Laurel and Hardy theme and everything, I started collecting Super 8 Black Hawk films. I had quite a collection. 
So by the time I met Hal Roach, when I was 20, I was quite an expert on their on their silent films. Right. OK. Um, so to provide some context to, to our chat today, uh, Craig, um, the Laurel and Hardy blog and the blogcast is following Stan and Babe's film careers together in chronological order, um, using the dates that they made the pictures rather than the release dates. So today we are in March and April of 1927. So we're still relatively early in their time at the Roach Studios. And before we get too far down that road, um, I wanted to spend a little bit of time just to explore the one person that was so pivotal and influential to the career and success of the boys as a comedy team, their boss, Hal Roach. And and now I know you got to know Mr. Roach quite well in his later years. Um, Can you tell us how that relationship and that that friendship came about? Okay, well, I had been living in Mexico I was studying at the University of Querétaro, which is in a beautiful town in the mountains, as a sort of a foreign exchange student, and I had my Super 8 Bolex camera. I was 19, 20 years old, traveling all over Mexico, filming everywhere. And uh, when I came home, I made a 40-minute documentary about Mexico with narration and everything. I sent it to UCLA motion picture television department. And to my delight, I was accepted to the film school that fall as one of 13, only 13 students chosen that year to be accepted. So, I mean, talk about culture shock. Here I had been living in Mexico. Suddenly I'm living in Los Angeles, California. And, uh, I re- and this is 1973, the fall of 1973. I'm 20 years old. One random, and one of my first courses was the history of American film comedy. My professor was David Bradley, who made a number of films in the 60s and whatnot and became a uh, theater professor. And I thought, well, what can I do? I wanted to write a really uh, vibrant term paper. And I thought, well, who could still be alive? Of course, this is way before the internet. I didn't know who was alive and who wasn't. I thought of Hal Roach. Well, I knew Laurel and Hardy had passed away, but could Hal Roach possibly be alive? He'd be in his early 80s. Why not? I looked in the phone book. I looked up Hal Roach, and sure enough, there was the name in Bel Air, California, with a phone number. So I called the number. And a little girl answered the phone. Hello. I said, is this the home of Hal Roach, who used to be a movie producer? Yes, it is. She must have been eight or nine years old. I said, oh, may I speak to him, please? Just a minute. Grandpa, telephone. And next thing I knew, I was talking to Hal Roach himself. Wow. That must have been pretty surreal. And I told her. So I told him, you know, I've been a fan of Laurel and Hardy. I collect their films. I made a Laurel and Hardy style comedy that was very well received. And now I'm starting as a student at UCLA Film School. And just off, I just spontaneously said, may I interview you for my school paper, you know? And he said, sure, sure. He said, I'll be at the, meet me at the Bel Air Country Club next week, such and such a time. I'll be in the card room. Well, you bet I was there. Yeah. That's uh, you must have been. Uh, I mean, you know, you just picked up the phone to a relative stranger, a complete stranger. I mean, that must have been pretty nerve wracking to think we're going to walk into this big movie movie mogul, uh, and you know, and just sort of sit down and have a chat. How, how did that feel? Oh, I was thrilled. It was hilarious. I describe it all in my book. It could have been like a little, uh, little comedy because uh, I didn't know where the card room was, and I had no idea what. Hal Roach might have looked like at that time. Was he a little wizened old man who could barely remember his name? Or, uh, you know, I had no idea what to expect. But, uh, yeah, I was shown to the card room. There were a bunch of uh, old gentlemen at tables playing cards. And there was Hal Roach, uh, very sportily dressed. Uh, And uh, I introduced myself. Oh, here he is. You know, he was just very gregarious. He said to his card playing buddies, uh, deal me out, boys. I'm going to have an interview. <laughs> and he, yeah, he took me to another quiet room. And uh, 
we just got along like gangbusters. He was pretty shocked that I knew so many facts about Laurel and Hardy, this and that. Of course, I read those books by John McCabe. And do you know William K. Everson's book? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Laurel and Hardy? Yeah. So I studied that and uh, I would add cast members and annotate my books. Yeah, I guess I was a bit of a fanatic about it all. Yeah, and I suppose was it your was it your um, your age, you know, that sort of surprised him so much? I think possibly so. I was a pretty uh, precocious young man in those days. Anyway, he liked my sense of humor too. Plus, I've been an actor. I started acting at the age of fourteen. I would write, act, direct, film, edit, learn editing, just the whole shebang, you know. So I was interested, I guess, in in the whole aspect of storytelling in cinema. And I guess Hal Roach picked up on all that. And he was like that too. He was very eclectic, you know. I mean, I came to realize he he could deal with the crazy clowns, the artists, the writers, the directors, and the technicians, and the business people. I mean, he had this overall view of everything. I later learned he had been a star football player in his high school. And uh, being the leader of your football team if you're good at that you're good at being the uh, boss of a movie company and dealing with all the different personalities and keeping everything going he was great plus he was uh just such a good-natured gentleman and uh he treated me like uh the age no the age didn't mean anything Uh, how did you come across could you banter back and forth did you have a sense of humor and he liked all that that's really nice. So, so he, did, he sort of talked to you as an equal rather than sort of um, humoring you, let's say. Oh, exactly. You know, this man, he, there was nothing pretentious about him, nothing snobbish. He was a real guy. I think he was always uh, pleased and uh, felt blessed that he'd been so successful. Because he, he, really, he really was sort of a working class kind of, you know, at, when he was young, he was a truck driver, uh, supervised trucks being sent down to California. That's how he ended up in Hollywood. Just a real man's man and a um, friendly guy. That's really nice. Because, I mean, you know, I mean, California, Hollywood, California is a million miles away from, from me where I am in the UK. And you sort of, you have these impressions, these ideas of what these people are like. But I have no idea what Hal Roach was like because you don't hear that much about him. I've read, you know, lots of books on Laurel and Hardy and Buster Keaton and Chaplin and Harold Lloyd. But I, you know, your, your book, in fact, is the first book I've got on Hal Roach, um, for obvious reasons. I don't think there are any others. <laughs> but, well, uh, there's, I- uh, this is interesting. Uh, William K. Everson wrote a very thin volume, uh, just a, sort of an outline of his career, back in about 65. Then in around 2005, there's the, uh, I, I don't recall the complete title, History of the Hal Roach Studios. Oh, uh, yes, another one, yeah. Uh, and it's uh, it's uh, quite a detailed account from a business and financial point of view with just touching on the personal and the history. I mean, that brings uh, me on to the next question. Uh, and find out, well, I think what, what I'll do is um, what I'd like to just ask you a little bit about, because we're talking about Hal Roach as a person. I mean, that's one thing I'd really like to get an understanding of today, if, if we can, is to try and understand a bit more about what was he like as a person, you know, just try and break down any of the myths. So to that end, what I was going to just say, I mean, 2018 was a quite a significant year for you and I, as it was the year that I started writing the Laurel and Hardy blog. Um, and also you uh, you published your book, um, The uh, 100 Years of Brodies. And also in 2018, um, it was a big year for Laurel and Hardy fans as it saw the release of the film Stan and Ollie starring Steve Coogan and John C. Riley. Now, I think it's fair to say opinions about the film are very mixed. I know mine certainly are. And in fact, we could probably fill an entire episode just debating the good and bad points of that film. Uh, But that's for another time. But for its many good qualities, the issues that I do have with it, and I know I'm not alone in this, is the way that the filmmakers, how do you say, basically made stuff up. Uh, You know, they interwove fact with quite a bit of fiction and possibly one of the worst examples of this, to my mind, and based on the little that I know, was their portrayal of Hal Roach as sort of a, you know, a cartoony, stereotypical, cigar-munching, money-grabbing Hollywood producer. So as someone who knew Hal Roach in real life, 
and granted it was a different point in his life than was depicted in the film. I'd really be interested to hear your thoughts on this particular aspect of that film, um, and was it indeed fiction as I believe it was? Well, first of all, um, that was the opening scene of the Stan and Ollie movie, with Laurel and Hardy heading towards the set to do their dance in Way Out West, and Hal Roach is uh, yelling at him and arguing with him. They're having a uh, dispute, right? Yeah. R- right there backstage. First of all, I, of course, I wasn't there. I can't say that never happened. But based on my knowing Mr. Roach and everything I've known about him, reading the personal papers in his archives, this is what really motivated me to write my book. Because at USC, University of Southern California, are housed the Hal Roach archives, which are the original business correspondence, telegrams, papers, documents that were rescued from the Roach studios just before they were knocked down. Uh, By the auctioneer, is that right? By the auctioneer. The auctioneer saved all the paperwork, dumped in boxes. It's wonderful. And they were uh, eventually housed at USC. And I got permission to go through all these boxes. Every single document took me nearly two years, but I was determined to do it because I thought, you know, I was over 60 years old by that point. I thought, I don't know how much more time I've got and no one else is doing this. And I'm, I'm a living uh, memory of Mr. Roach himself. And I know Richard W. Ban, maybe the only other one still alive, you know. So I guess I'd better do it. That's what I dedicated myself to. And I, all, through the whole process, it was like, what would, what would Mr. Roach say? Now, I wanted to be absolutely fair and honest and uh, no one's perfect in life. But I'll tell you, he was one of the finest men I ever knew. Because not only, okay, 20 years old, that's when I first met him, but we stayed in touch over the years. And uh, in 1988, and I moved to New York City but I would still keep in touch with him over the phone. When I'd come to California, I would visit. He always welcomed me. And uh, in 1988, I'm back living in LA. And this was the discovery and the screening of the Spanish language shorts. Oh, yeah. They had finally been restored and they had a special... Uh, a week or so of screenings at U- UCLA. It was fabulous. Of course, I had lived in Mexico. I speak Spanish fluently. I got such a kick out of listening to Laurel and Hardy speaking in Spanish. <laughs> yeah, Beth. And it was hilarious. Their accents and everything doubled the comedy, if you can believe it. Yes. This is why they became such popular stars in Mexico, South America, and Spain, which I found the documentation letters pouring into the Hal Roach studios from all those countries saying what huge hits they were. There was a Spanish speaking movie theater in Manhattan back in the, in 29, 30, 31. That, uh, their first uh, night owls, ladrones, it was called, which is even better edited. And, uh, they had more footage in these Spanish language versions. I think ladrones in Spanish is a pure masterpiece. And they had a fantastic ending, which was not in Night Owls, just as a side note. But anyway, there I was at UCLA watching, and there was my professor, uh, Rosen. And uh, he said, do you know Hal Roach is looking for a writing assistant? I said, you're kidding. I said, no, he, he wants to make a comeback comedy. Hal Roach was 96 years old at that time. <laughs> I said, tell him I'm in town and I'd be happy to help him. Yeah. Well, next thing you know, he's inviting me to stay in his house in Bel Air and work on this script. So this was an, an whole other experience. Yeah. And he was a 96-year-old man at this point, and you've got to bear that in mind. And he, and he was dead serious about producing a new comedy. Oh, yes, he was. Oh, he was... Very, he was very serious about his uh, films, his career, and this, that, and everything else. 
No, he was a very accomplished and serious man. Otherwise, he'd never have done half the things he did. Yeah, of course. Because it's interesting. I, I was listening um, just the other day to uh, Hal Roach talking, I think that was at UCLA in, the, in 1970, so probably just a couple of years before you met him for the first time. Um, it's on YouTube. Um, mm. and, and he was talking then. I mean, how, how old would he be then? Probably... What, eight He'd have been like uh, maybe seventy-eight or so. Yeah, late seventies. Yeah, and he and I think somebody asked him the question. You know, are you wanting to, um, you know, do? I know what wasn't there. Sorry, no, it was Letterman. It was on the Letterman show. That's right. And yeah, I think Letterman asked him then. You know, are you going to carry on? Do you want to do anything? I said, oh no, I'm I'm too old for it now. I, you know, nobody would want me to because he had all these ideas. He said for all these different comedies. I'm getting a little bit. Of, I remember that very well. Because I watched that when I was in New York City, and uh, yeah, he he was a great guy. But no, he but he probably didn't know he'd live to be ninety six, <laughs> let alone a hundred. But he would tell me, "This is the amazing thing." So we would uh, we would work on the script and uh, have dinner together. He had a wonderful housekeeper cook who prepared wonderful meals. And I'd have a chance to talk because he was so in the in the moment. Uh, he wasn't a nostalgic kind of guy reminiscing about the past unless, you know, what about he had pictures uh, in his dining room of all the celebrities and everything and Will Rogers. So I'd ask him about Will Rogers and he taught me to play polo, uh, things like that. So we had lots of stories you can imagine. And did he have, I mean, you know, there's, there's the, we have this kind of story in this, in Laurel and Hardy lore, I guess, if you know, uh, if you will, about the fallout between he and Stan, um, you know, around the time of Babes in Toyland. Did he ever make any mention of that to you? Oh, he right? sure did by my very first meeting with him. Now, I re- you know, hey, uh, he, ha- he could have a temper, that Irish temper could flare up. Uh, and he was just as adamant about Stan Laurel, uh, had a horrible idea for babes in Toyland. He had the greatest idea. Uh, he, it was still rankling him to that day. Was it really? I want to, I want to, yes, it, yes, uh, th- I'm afraid so. And, uh, I, d- I only discovered later, he didn't tell me any of these details, but I discovered later all the, uh, difficulties he had with Stan Laurel. It wasn't all Hal Roach's fault at all. Cause Stan was getting married, divorced, going out in, uh, one of his gals got into a lot of trouble getting drunk and smashing her car up. You know, that was not good publicity for a family oriented comedy team. So that plus the contractual things, Roach was a clever businessman. Uh, so yeah, I'm afraid so. Things did sour between them, uh, in the latter part of the thirties, but, but they worked it out and up until, you know, everyone knows that Stan and Ollie left Roach studios in 1940 and then they went off to 20th century Fox, et cetera. But did you know, in 1941, I found a document from one Roach, uh, staffer to another saying, we tried to get Laurel and Hardy for the new Streamline Army comedies, but uh, either they had just signed with 20th Century Fox, I'm not sure, but they turned them down. The Roach Studios wanted them back, okay? That, I found, that is a fact. And then, of course, uh, Hal Roach Jr. invited them back to do color television shows in the 50s. So uh, it, it wasn't an irreparable break. It was just very creative, strong personalities disagreeing on certain issues. Yeah, creative differences, as you say. Yeah. Now, what I want to say about the Stan and Ollie movie, I would, I, Hal Roach had tremendous respect for his actors, the employees, and everything. I could never imagine him stopping Laurel and Hardy just about to film their wonderful dance scene by arguing with them about business. What are you looking for, Stan? I'm looking for a fair price for a Laurel and Hardy picture, and you know it. Our pictures sell all around the world and we haven't got a dime. That's because we keep getting divorced. No, it's because you're a cheapskate who got rich off our backs. Oh, come on now, Stan. He is. He's a cheapskate, a skin flint, and a, and a parvenu. A parvenu? He thinks because my contract's up and yours isn't that I won't be able to go anyplace else and I'll have to take what he's offering. Wait, 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 wait. Mr. Roach? What's a parvenu? Well, it's, it's someone who started out with nothing, got rich, but has no class. Look it up in the dictionary, Hal. There's a picture of you. Oh, you think you're some sort of smart ass, huh? Well, guess what? I'm smarter. Yeah. No, I 
it would never have happened. And if he would have, he would have said, uh, let's meet after your shooting and discuss this in the privacy of the office. They were gentlemen. Okay. Hal Roach was a gentleman. Yeah. He wasn't crude and crass. Like he was earthy. You know, there's a big difference. Yes. He was real, genuine. He spoke his mind, get angry and he'd get over it. Uh, he'd yell at me a few times for a few things, but I knew it, I knew it was, I also factored in the 96 year old part of it, <laughs> you know, uh, but he, he maintained a sense of humor and everything, but he was frustrated. You can imagine this script that he wanted me to work on. I discovered later that this is, well, this was at least a 30 year old project that he'd been trying to get set up. And at one point he says to me, he says, Hollywood is prejudiced against 96 year old producers. So he didn't have it easy. But like I say, I, I, I would bet my bottom dollar he never stopped Laurel and Hardy backstage so all the stage crew and cast could hear him berating them, getting into an argument. I doubt it 100%. And also one of the, the subject matters that they were supposedly arguing about was money. Um, and the, you know, Oh, that's that, another thing. Yeah, Stan called him a skin flint, this and that. You kept all our money. That's ridiculous. He paid them a fabulous salary, Stan more than Ollie, because Stan was more – involved with the creative and post-production aspects of it. But my gosh, and first of all, Hal Roach became very financially successful years before Laurel and Hardy teamed with him. And he was a very generous man. But the thing was, he did like to keep Laurel and Hardy on separate contracts. Yes, as you say, clever businessman. Yeah, why not? He's got to protect his investment, doesn't he? He's yeah, impressed. but also in that stand, remember the scene... Uh, Oh my gosh, Stan calls Ollie a lazy ass or something. That's right. And, yes, and yeah. Ollie says you're a hollow man. You know something? You're just a lazy ass who got lucky because you met me. Lucky? To spend my life with a hollow man who hides behind his typewriter? You're not real, Stan. You're hollow. You're empty. That is pure BS. I'm sorry. Stan Laurel, a hollow man. Are you kidding me? That Ollie would even say that. And he let threw alone a red, red roll at the back of his head, didn't he, as well? And throw the roll at him? That's ridiculous. Yeah. Nah, yeah. nah, nah. Yeah. I, no I, that's that. libel. I'd, I'd sue, you know. <laughs> that's ridiculous. All right. But this is, I mean, this is the problem, isn't it? You know, it, it's, it's a film that had great potential. I mean, it was very well done. It had a lot of heart and a lot of soul to it, which I was pleased about. But, you know, why fabricate stuff when the story as it, as it stood was, is, is brilliant and really interesting? And it is, and that, fabulously acted and yeah. it had so many moving scenes. Oh, yes. Now, yeah. the wives were a little caricatured, weren't they? A little yeah. cartoony. Yeah, but good. But I, but I could I could put up with that. It was entertaining. And I don't know why his... Uh, Stan's last wife was an opera singer, or she liked to sing opera. But they made her something else, a dancer, was it? Why would they change that fact? I don't see why. Never heard of such goings off. On. So, but this is great. I mean, this is it's it's great because you know, as I say, I, I really want to try and get an understanding of what Hal Roach was like as a person. I'm certainly starting to do that now. Can you give us like a, a bit of a potted history of of Hal and where he came from? You know, how did he become this sort of king of comedy? And uh, uh, oh and gosh, sort of, of course, what, it's all described in detail in my book. But um, the nutshell version might be: he was born in the the town of Elmira, New York, which is north of New York City, upstate New York which, believe it or not, was the summer home of Mark Twain, who wrote Huckleberry Finn there. And in fact, I think one of Roach's most impressive early memories was Mark Twain coming to his, uh, it might have been the church or his school, to it give was a his talk. Sunday school. I heard was it the other day, school? actually, Craig. Yeah, it's his Sunday school. He, he said that on the Letterman show as well. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Well, I realized that Americana of Mark Twain that down home, you know, regular folks kind of humor is what Hal Roach uh, resonated with. And you can see it in, you know, all his movies, really. Um, he'd, he'd make fun of the rich and the snobbish. He'd make fun of authority figures. And he was always on the side of the underdog. 
I think he was that way all his life. So uh, apparently he was excellent in sports. And uh, when he was right after high school, I guess, he went out west. He even went to Alaska. And uh, he had an aunt living in Seattle, Washington. He, wor- he stayed with her and worked for an ice cream company, I recall. And then he, he was given the job of supervising the transfer of a fleet of trucks. Now, we're talking 1912. These are old-fashioned type trucks that had to be sent from the Northwest all the way down to California. And he, he said they busted up in the desert. I don't know the details. There are a lot of details I still don't know. When I knew him and was even living in his home, there were so many things he wouldn't talk about. And I didn't discover until two decades later when I'm going through the papers and discovering all these things, you know. And uh, I also researched obscure movie magazines uh, newspapers from around the world, gleaned everything, pieced them together to, to write my book. He, uh, he hobnobbed with presidents. You've probably seen pictures of him with Ronald Reagan. Yes. But do you know I discovered in 1923, President Harding was in the White House, who was about to have a tour of Hollywood. And Hal Roach was put in charge of being the host for President Harding and his and his group to travel and see all the Hollywood studios. Well, do you know what happened? Just before the, that Harding was coming, to, I think it was in San Francisco, he died. That's right. I've just read that bit in your book. Yeah. <laughs> right. And so Hal Roach, you know, he hobnobbed with the, the, the hoi polo and the big, big guys up there in the uh, upper echelons, shall we say. I mean, I know Queen Elizabeth, uh, who was it? George, who was their father? George V? Anyway, he was a big Laurel and Hardy fan, and he, he had their films uh, screened at Bel- Balmaro, their, their summer estate or something. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, Hitler loved <laughs> Laurel and Hardy, and Mussolini, that's a big, uh, a big yeah. controversy. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So, uh, but I, I sorted all that out myself, and I've heard people say Hal Roach was anti-Semitic. Now, I just, well, I'm Jewish, by the way. Do you think he invite a Jewish boy to come and stay in his home? I don't think so. Unlikely, yeah. He didn't have a prejudice bone in his body, actually. And he's the one who signed the first African-American uh, to, a, to a movie contract, Sunshine Sammy Morrison. And he had black kids in his uh, shows. Now, years later, they would say, oh, maybe they're making a big deal out of it. And, uh, but that's twisting history, you know. I also discovered in the late 40s, the South now, that was a prejudicial region. And they had censors that refused to allow movies or they would cut the scenes out entirely. If there were any black actors mingling with the white actors, they'd cut those scenes out. And a lot of the great stars you know, Bo Jangles and Dorothy Dandridge and that, they were all cut out of Southern movies. And Hal Roach headed a campaign to stop all that. Yeah, I don't think people re- realize that. No, no. This is in the 40s, before the, uh, the heavy-duty civil rights movement of the 50s. Hal Roach was trying to bring equality to the movies then, back then. Yeah. So, uh, so he had an, so then he saw an advertisement, cowboy actors wanted. If you have a cowboy outfit, can ride a horse. Well, he had a cowboy outfit and he could ride a horse. And then he was, uh, he was chosen about the men would meet at Gower Gulch. Do you know, it's still there. Uh, there is a Denny's restaurant there is a, I think it's a Rite Aid or CVS, and there are different shops. And it's all, it all looks like a little mini Western town. And they <laughs> even have an old wagon. And most people that go by have no idea that it is um, just a reminiscence of the days when the cowboy actors would gather to be chosen for the, the silent films that would be filmed during the day. That's how Roach got his start. That's brilliant. So he started, um, he decided with, uh, yeah, that's right, he went with Harold Lloyd, didn't he, to uh, um, 
well, he started up the Rolling Film Company um, and took Lloyd with him to be the star. He met Lloyd. Uh, they were both extras and bit players. And uh, there are different accounts of how Roach got his money. Some say he inherited a few thousand dollars. Uh, others say that he teamed up with some young businessmen and they pooled their resources and formed the corporation. That's a fact. They, in July 1914, they formed the Roland Film Company, R-O-L-I-N, the R-O for Roach, and Lynn for Linthicum. Dan Linthicum was his business partner. And they, I think they rented an old Victorian mansion in the hills near uh, downtown L.A., and started filming at the parks in the streets with Harold Lloyd and a few others. That's how he got his start. And eventually, Pathé Exchange, which is the oldest motion picture distributing company in the world, which was started in 1896 in Paris, they had a branch in New York City by 1904. Well, they accepted his film, Just Nuts. That started, that launched his career. They accepted that film for distribution and they demanded more. And that's how it all started. And, uh, and so Stan and Babe, obviously, from totally different backgrounds. Um, and they came to, I know they came to, to the Roach Studio. I understand had a, two or three uh, stabs at... Uh, oh, Stan, uh, Hal Road went to a, uh, I think it was a vaudeville house in downtown L.A. I think it was 1917. And uh, Stan was performing with his common-law wife, May Laurel. And Roach thought they were very funny. He, he thought Laurel was funny. He didn't want the wife. <laughs> that led to consternations later. Yeah. And, uh, but he signed up, uh, Stan for a series of shorts. And then Stan went on to make films with Joe Rock, which did include May Laurel. And somewhere Joe Rock said, uh, May Laurel wanted to be a leading lady, but she was more a character woman. If only she looked in the mirror. <laughs> so, so uh, at some point, Stan did ditch her. She kept uh, nagging him over the years to get alimony or whatnot, even though she was just a common-law wife. So poor Stan was nagged. You see the movies where they're just nagged and bullied by their wives. Well, there's, there is definitely some uh, truth to that <laughs> in their reality, you know? Yeah. So Stan, and then Stan just, oh, I think with Joe Rock, uh, he had an agreement that he would not act for any other producer. This is... Later, in, Oh, he came back to Roach in about 23, 23 to 24, made some more shorts. In fact, May Laurel might have been in a couple of those now that I think about it. But by 25, 26, Laurel was behind the cameras writing and directing. And by 1925, Oliver Hardy, who had had a long career already, had been working at the Hal Roach Studios. So by 25, they're both working at the Hal Roach Studios. And it was 1926 when they made Duck Soup together. Now, I'll bet that uh, Stan Laurel was responsible for that. After all, it was his father's story. He was already directing and writing scripts. But the next one they made at the Hal Roach Studios was called Slipping Wives. They weren't a team then, but it was a story by Hal Roach. And do you know the next several, and I've made a little list here because it's fascinating to see how their team evolved. Then they made uh, Love Em and Weep with a story by Hal Roach, Fred Gull, and Stan Laurel. Then they made Why Girls Love Sailors, story by Hal Roach. Then with Love and Hisses, story by Hal Roach. And Sailors Beware, story by Hal Roach. And we later discovered it was directed by Hal Roach, even though Hal Yates is uh, credited as the director. But looking at the date books, you know, they had a very, very uh, well-documented uh, worksheets and books about the productions. So it, de it determined that Hal Yates only did one day of retakes. And for some reason, he was given the full director credit. Hal Roach, see, he was very, he, he didn't need all that glory. His name was on, you know, the beginning of yeah, everything. 
course. So, uh, but that's, I found that interesting. Uh, now I'll tell one also had a story by Hal, that was Hal Roach's story. Do detectives think was Hal Roach's story? He had a lot more influence than a lot of people realized. Flying Elephants was directed by Hal Roach and a Hal Roach story. It was when they really, you know, with second hundred years, hats off and, and on and on, Hal Roach uh, left it to the others. And we'll take a short break from our interview with Craig, as it's now time for today's first audio blog, as we discuss the next film in the Laurel and Hardy canon. Sailors Beware was filmed April 4th to April 14th, 1927. It was produced and directed by Hal Roach, with retakes directed by Hal Yates on April 18th. Titles by H.M. Walker. The main cast, Stan Laurel, Oliver Hardy, Anita Garvin and Harry Earls, with appearances by Frank Brownlee, Lupe Velez, Tiny Sanford, Viola Richard and Dorothy Coburn. I really like Sailors Beware. Yes, it has all the frustrations of the majority of the pre-team films, primarily to do with the boys being cast as opponents of sorts and not portraying the fully developed Stan and Ollie characters that we want them to. But there are some very funny gags, a great cast with super performances and the sets are quite lavish compared to the majority of the boys' early Hal Roach pictures. So once again, Stan and Babe, as part of the Roach All-Stars, are set against each other rather than facing the world together. Stan plays the part of Chester Chaste, a cab driver who was unwittingly loaded with his burning cab on board a cruise liner. Ollie plays the part of Crider, the purser on board the SS Miramar. There are some clearly recognisable Ollie traits on display here. His genteel smoothness with the ladies is quite lovely and very Ollie-like, despite the fact that the purser is in fact a bit of a lecherous creep. But then, again very un like he's very aggressive and abusive to the male passengers. There's a great scene at the start of the picture that introduces us to his character, where he's welcoming passengers onto the cruise ship. To the ladies, he's very charming and all smiles, but then when the male passenger steps up, he very rudely barks at them to move along and get on board. Babe's transitions alternating from charm to rudeness and then back again is just sublime. Joining the boys for her second film in a row is the excellent Anita Garvin, who plays international crook Madame Ritz. Garvin's husband and partner in crime, played by Harry Earls, is a dwarf who tricks fellow passengers into believing he's Garvin's baby, whilst actually scamming them out of their money and valuables. Most known for his role in Freaks, 1932, Earls was actually 25 years old during the making of Sailors Beware, and he plays his part extremely well. Any scene with a baby smoking a big fat cigar is always worthy of a laugh. Reviewing the film, Moving Picture World, September 24th, 1927, wrote Sailors Beware, Pathé, Two Reels. With Anita Garvin in the leading feminine role, Stan Laurel is the star of this Hal Roach comedy, which rates as a good slapstick offering. Stan is cast as a boob taxi driver, whose car with him in it is accidentally hoisted on a transoceanic steamship. He's forced to work his passage as a steward, and succeeds in unmasking a pair of jewel thieves. A novel touch shows the woman, played by Miss Garvin, aided by her husband, portrayed by a midget. The midget dresses as a baby in order to aid her in disarmed suspicion, but the scheme goes bluey. There's a lot of chase stuff and farce comedy mix-ups. Oliver Hardy, Frank Brownlee, Lupe Velez and Viola Richie are included in the cast, and Hal Yates directed. As the review states, Viola Richard appears once again, if only for a couple of scenes while she's playing cards with the scheming Anita Garvin. Garvin is being helped to cheat by her baby, whose pram is positioned behind the other players and proceeds to signal to his wife what cards the other players are holding. Stan spots this foul play and quickly spoils their scam by ensuring Viola Richard plays the right cards to win. Also of note in the cast list and taking up even smaller roles are Laurel and Hardy regulars Tiny Sanford and Dorothy Coburn. As mentioned above and featured in an uncredited role, playing the part of Baroness Bear, is Mexican-born Lupe Velez. This was Velez's second film role, but her two films with Hal Roach were enough to kickstart her movie career, as an article in Screenland magazine, March 1928 states. Pep incarnate is what Hollywood call Lupe Velez. She is a little devil on the screen, and a lot of it isn't acting. When Lupe danced, she packed the house. They cheered, they threw her flowers, money, jewels... After a time, her fame reached California, and she was signed for a featured dance in the Hollywood Music Box Review. Hal Roach, comedy producer, thought he would take in the Music Box show one evening. 
contrary to his custom, he had the very dickens of a time to obtain seats. After he had seen Lupe dance, he knew why. It came to him that she was the very star he needed for his comedies, and she signed a contract that evening in her dressing room. It was only necessary for her to make two comedies for Ouch, What Women Did For Me and Sailors Beware, and straight away Douglas Fairbanks found out she was the only leading woman possible for the gaucho. So Lupe Valais is made. After appearing with the boys before they were even an official comedy team, Velez would go on to make one more film with them, sharing a tit-for-tat, egg-breaking scene in 1934's MGM spectacular Hollywood Party. Perhaps most noteworthy from a historical perspective is that this film is the first short starring both Stan and Babe together in which Babe performs what would become a trademark look directly into the camera to connect with the viewing audience in order to get across his usually despairing feelings. While it's very true to say that this is not the first time Mollick has performed this on screen, he used it earlier in his career at the likes of the Vim and also the Lubin Studios, but he was certainly now perfecting his craft here. In addition to this, in a 1954 interview with John McCabe for McCabe's groundbreaking biography, Mr Laurel and Mr Hardy, Babe himself remembered this same scene, although at the time he mistakenly attributed it to the wrong film, as the first time he performed his iconic tight riddle. Quote, in one sequence, he opens the door, but is met with a pail of water in the face. I was expecting it, Babe admitted later, and yet in a way, I wasn't. I had a vague memory of it being part of the action coming up, but as I recall, I didn't expect it at that particular moment. It threw me mentally just for a second or so, and I just couldn't think of what to do next. The camera was grinding away, and I knew I had to do something, so I thought of blowing my nose with my wet and sopping tie. I was raising my tie to my nose when all of a sudden I realised that this would be a bit vulgar. There were some ladies watching us. So I waved the tie in a kind of tiddly-widdly fashion, in a kind of comic way, to show that I was embarrassed. I improved on that little bit of business later on, and I used it for any number of situations. But usually I did it when I had to show extreme embarrassment, while trying to look friendly at the same time. And that's how the tie twiddle was born. The actual film footage doesn't exactly mirror Babe's re recollections. He was, after all, remembering a scene shot around 27 years previously. But watching it back, you can almost visibly see him going through that creative thought process that he's describing. And it's certainly very possible that the spark of the idea for the tight riddle was generated here. Because of this scene, I really believe that Sailors Beware can be deemed a pivotal moment, something of a turning point not only in the development of Ollie's character, but also in the formation of the Laurel and Hardy team more generally. Stan once again turns in a great performance with a scattering of trademarks. I suspect this film contains a record number of his famous cries so far in his career. Some of Stan's gags, whilst making me laugh out loud, were also unexpected. For instance, in the scene leading up to Ollie soaking, he pushes a couple of annoying snooty bathers, one of them being Lupe Velez, into the pool, seemingly just because he feels like it. Also, later in the film, when he's asked to push the baby in its pram down the grand staircase, and because he suspects the baby is not what he appears, he just shoves the pram, baby and all, to free fall down the stairs. Both very funny scenes, but probably more funny because one doesn't expect that sort of behaviour from Stan, and so the gags come as a surprise. Stan's character is quite fast-paced, not the slowed-down, dim-witted Stanley character yet. He's still quite belligerent towards anybody who crosses him, and is quick to get into heated debates with people in authority, which is at odds with the Stanley that we know and love. But even so, his performance is very enjoyable. There are once again a nice few exchanges between the boys, and it's just a real shame there aren't more of them. One of my absolute favourite scenes in this film is the skipping gag, where Stan, running away from Ollie, joins in with the lady who is skipping rope. Then Ollie has to literally count himself in in order to get close to him. So in the end, all three are jumping the rope together, and this really tickles me. The acting is great, and the comic timing is just brilliant. The film's overall reception appears to have been very positive, with the following review from the film Daily, 18th of September, 1927, being fairly representative. Sailors beware, corking comedy. The gag man has excellent material to work with here, nor does he muff an opportunity to get the most out of every situation. As a result, you have a neat, tidy comedy that can hold its head high with the best in the short subject line. Stan Laurel is a wow as a taxi driver who is accidentally shanghaied aboard an ocean liner and is forced to work his way across. All told, here is a laugh fest, well made, dressed in feature style and hitting on all six for entertainment all the way. So 
So at this point, um, Craig, shall we um, have a little talk about about Sailors Beware, the first film um, that we're going to look at today? Um, what are your What are your thoughts as a as a as a film fan, a Laurel and Hardy fan, about Sailors Beware? Oh, the first thing I would say is. Stan has a lot of his Stanley characteristics in this. He's not such a brash, you know, he's energetic and everything, but he has lots of his Stanley smiles. He cries a lot. Yeah. That Stanley yeah. cry. And uh, he looks at the camera a lot. He doesn't do that much later, but I think that inspired Ollie to start looking at the camera. And And Ollie, when he's doused with water, he gives a few... Yeah, then you see those Ollie looks. So there it is. There it is right there in Sailors Beware. I think that's yeah. quite fascinating. Yeah, I think it's a very, I was you know, saying earlier, I, I think it's a very pivotal film uh, for Stan and Babe. There is there is so much there. There is still, uh, you know, a, a bit of a brashness about Stan's character. He's very determined. He's very kind of, um, not aggressive, but he knows what he wants and he's and he'll, he'll sort of argue the tot over it. Well, Up the circumstances, point, he's hijacked on a, on a ship. Yeah. A taxi cab. It's the last thing he wants to do. So I, you know, I can't imagine it. Uh, anyone playing it any differently, really? <laughs> That's right. Dignity. And, uh, Could you imagine being uh, hoisted onto a ship when you just want to <laughs> drive around in your taxi cab, which was on fire? <laughs> which was on fire on top of it. Yes. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we, so we'll push his points, you know, so far until he's pushed back, and then he starts to cry, you know. But I, th- I just think the the performances of this of both Stan and Babe are just wonderful, and so much. Um, I don't want to say improved, but I think it's probably the wrong word. But it's just so it's so much more defined, I think, as, as characters um, as they're going on, and you can really see that movement now towards the team uh, beginning to form in this film. Mm-hmm. Definitely, it was uh, photographed by Fred Jackman, who had been Hal Roach's director of his outdoor features and serials back in the early twenties. He did a serial called White Eagle another serial called Timber Queen, 1922, and uh, Jackman directed those. Then he directed Call of the Wild, which was a huge hit in 1923, and alas, I think it seems to be a missing film. Call of the Wild, if anyone knows where that might be. Now, I got to tell you about my experience in 1988 with Hal Roach. Yeah. And the, I mean... Look, it didn't turn out, it's not a great success story and happy, wonderful, you know, red carpet events after that. No, think of the context. The man was 96 years of age. I was in my early 30s and I had, you know, left my own apartment to stay with him. It wasn't like I needed a place to live and was grateful to live there. I mean, I disrupted everything because of this opportunity, right? Yeah. And, uh, well, Unbelievably, I was hired by MGM UA. At that point, MGM and United Artists had combined into one studio. I was hired while I was at Hal Roach's home, a full-time position at MGM UA. Hal Roach had, of course, been associated with both MGM and United Artists. I mean, he got such a kick out of that. (laughs) <laughs> he said, well, you've got to go. He says, you know, well, we could, we could finish this project some other time, but you can't. I said, Mr. Roach, I can't pass up this opportunity, right? And uh, so with his blessings, I left without completing this new project or script or anything. And, uh, of course, life sweeps you up into other things. Of course it does, yeah. And what was the script like? Was it was it was it a good script? Was it worth working on? Or, you he know? basically just had the outline. I was quite surprised that it was called Punch and Hootie, <laughs> and he wanted a com. He wanted to create a new comedy team, and I'm uh, modestly saying at one point, because Hal Roach knew about my my acting career, I had won an award and. Uh, I did Shakespeare. I did all kinds of comedies uh, in the theater, live theater. I hadn't done much film or TV at all, really. Uh, But he said, I want you to be one half of this comedy team. Well, I was just so, and I said, are you serious? He says, yes, I am. Well, you know, he took his chance. 
He loved experimenting and trying new people. Some of them worked, some of them didn't. We all know that. Uh, but he was willing to take a chance with me, and I was just delighted, you know. And now for our final audio blog of today's programme. Now I'll Tell One was a Charlie Chase short, filmed 20th to the 25th of April 1927. It was produced by Hal Roach, directed by James Parrott, main cast Charlie Chase, Edna Marion, Stan Laurel and of course Oliver Hardy. Now I'll Tell One is, or at least was, a long lost Charlie Chase comedy, which was marketed as starring Stan Laurel. As such, Laurel and Hardy historians didn't pay too much attention, until, that is, in 1989, the film's second reel was uncovered by film researcher Dave Wyatt. To everyone's surprise, this significant discovery became all the more significant, as not only did it fill in a missing piece of the Stan Laurel catalogue, but it also made sure that the previously acknowledged tally of films starring Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy increased to 107. The newly discovered second reel confirmed not only Stan's role as Charlie Chase's lawyer, but also revealed Babe Hardy playing the part of a policeman investigating a disturbance at Charlie Chase's house. This was a truly momentous find, and proof that even today, lost films can still be discovered by individuals such as the excellent Mr Dave Wyatt. So there may still be hope yet for hats off. The stand we see in this film is the old pre-teaming one with the little round glasses, as in many of the solo films such as Dr Pickle and Mr Pride and The Sleuth, both from 1925. In fact, his character arguably appears in both looks and manner to be the very same that he would go on to portray three films later in Sugar Daddies, 1927. There aren't many signs of the Stanley traits that become so familiar and iconic, but it appears to be a solid performance without overshadowing the main star of the picture. Following its general release by Pathé on the 5th of October 1927, the film seems to have been reasonably well received, although the reviewer for Motion Picture News, October 14th, 1927, couldn't quite seem to make up their minds, writing, Charlie Chase has been putting out such uniformly good comedies, it should be expected that he would fall down slightly on occasions. This is one of those occasions. It is not a total bust by any means. In fact, it is fairly good, but just not up to the standard set by Charlie. The story gives promise of developing into a lively one until they inject the character portrayed by Stan Laurel, that of a correspondence school lawyer. It is not humorous as it was undoubtedly intended it should be, and all it does is slow up the action. This is no fault of Laurel's. The character does not fit. Chase injects considerable humour within the comparatively small opportunity given him, but he is capable of much better things. The story revolves around the divorce suit of his wife, whose unscrupulous lawyers weave a network of lies for her. A foreigner among the courtroom becomes riled at Charles and takes a punch at him. Charlie's wife joins up with him and they, and they give the foreigner a good beating, as a result of which the divorce complaint is dismissed. Moving Picture World, October 29th, 1927, was a little more positive. Now I'll tell one, Pathé, two reels. Charlie Chase has some crackerjack comedies that rank away above the average two-reeler, but this one can hold its own with the best of them. It is bright, clever, fast-moving, with a good comedy idea well handled, and is a laugh from start to finish. Charlie and Edna are happily married. One quarrel leads to a divorce, court, where, egged on by a vamping judge, Edna makes up a wild series of yarns as to how he was cruel, got drunk, abused her, etc., each of these is pictured and cleverly travestied, and in addition, there are some additional comedy bits introduced in the courtroom procedure and the absurd antics of Charlie's lawyer portrayed by Stan Laurel. There is not a dull moment here, and this comedy should go well with any type of audience. It's a Hal Roach offering. The picture must have been in circulation for quite some time, as 12 months later, exhibitors Herald and Moving Picture World, from October 13th, 1928, described it as a very funny comedy. And even three years later on, January 4th, 1930, Exhibitors Herald World were still advertising it as showing at the Fairfax Theatre, Kilmarnock, VA, commenting, Very good, yes, it's old, but that makes no difference with good comedy. The rediscovered second reel of Now I'll Tell One was screened publicly for the first time as part of the Stan Laurel Centenary Celebrations in London in 1990. 
I'd like to thank and acknowledge two fantastic resources, uh, www.lordheath.com and www.laurelandhardycentral.com uh, for information that I used in this blog. And now let's rejoin our interview with Craig. That's a good idea. Well, let's let's talk about um, if there's well if there's anything to talk about. Um, what what are your thoughts on the second film that we were looked at today, Craig? So we were looked at um, now. I'll tell one, Charlie Chase. Well, I found only the uh, second reel. I think that's the only one that's in existence, and it was in a pretty bad print, but it had some amusing little. Uh, you know, Ollie Ollie appears as a police officer in that's the right. first minute, I believe. And he's typical Ollie. You know, he's just great. No matter what he does, yes. any scene he's in, he gives it his all. <laughs> he steals the scene, doesn't he? He really does. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, talk about serendipity. Those two talents coming together like that. Yeah. And I thought, you know, I do think that it's, it's the, the film is really nice that it gives us that chance to see Stan and Charlie Chase working together. Yeah, definitely. So they all, they just had a, you know, the lot of fun. They just had, what a great group of creative geniuses i'd call them yeah what was charlie chase's background because i know he came well charles parrot came to the studio quite early on and all singing all dancing i believe he was uh yeah all around performer and he'd been with max senate of course and uh many say he set the tone of of the comedy at the hellroot studios from the early days and he even brought babe hardy to the studio and he brought uh uh, Robert Mc, Mc, what was his name? The director of the Our Gang Kids. Oh, um, McGowan. McGowan? Yep, Bob McGowan. Yeah, I believe so. And so he was a, a very early influence there, so strong. And of course, he lasted until 1936. I never uh, understood why why it ended then. There, there's still a lot of uh, mysteries about certain details. May Bush, by the way, her last movie was The Bohemian Girl. Did you ever wonder why she never came back to the Hal Roach Studios? May Bush ended up suing the Hal Roach Studios. Really? Yeah. So you can find out about it in my book. I found it in the documents. Yes, I'll be, I'll be thumbing through that shortly, as soon as we get off. Okay. <laughs> you know, uh, he just had such a great group of creative people. It all works so well together. And I mean, even in his 80s and 90s, Hal Roach was a gregarious host, a wonderful conversationalist. Oh, he was a terrific man, I'll tell you. What was his home like, Craig? You said you, you lived in his home for, for some time. What, what sort of a home does an old... Well, the house that I went to visit him, I think uh, he had lived in a huge Beverly Hills mansion from the 30s until the early 60s, I believe. And then, you know, his studio went bankrupt. I think he downsized a bit, quite a bit. So he had a modest single-story house in Bel Air, which is a very exclusive neighborhood. He's way up in the hills. You had to drive up windy streets to get there. The last time I saw him in May of 1992, he had been 100 years old for several months already. But it was right after the L.A. riots the Rodney King riots, which was just devastating. I was living in Hollywood at the time, and, oh, it was just horrible. Uh, I'm, I'm lucky to have survived, frankly. Um, that's a whole other story. But uh, it was days after that all ended when I was invited to visit Hal Roach, and I remember driving up into those hills and saying, oh, how blessed to be uh, untouched by all this civil unrest that was going on down in the flats, they would call it. Uh, but so he lived in splendid comfort uh, in a modest single story house. He had a swimming. There's nothing ostentatious at all about the house. Pretty uh, middle class, upper middle class, I guess you'd say. So he'd had the mansion lifestyle, you know, like the Harold Lloyd's Green Acres and that kind of thing. He was living in the lap of luxury in the in his heyday. Yes, yes, indeed. He had his own chauffeur and this and that, and he had gardeners, several servants and this and that. Now he was living, his wife had passed away, his second wife. I think he was lonely, even though he, his girlfriend was Frances Hilton. I think that was uh, Paris Hilton's grandmother. 
So he always had a date, you know. I mean, he was doing terrific for 96. <laughs> and he always seemed very well connected as well. You know, when I started reading your book and it's talking about, you know, he was in one of the first uh, film studios where he was working. He'd got, uh, was it Chaplin in the, in the next uh, side and he also knew Buster Keaton and did did he did he often mention all of that uh, he of that talked kind? In, yes indeed my the first you know and I met him for two long sessions back in 73 to write my term paper where we totally focused on his career and everything and he talked about Chaplin he was Chaplin's roommate in the early days oh wow and he would talk about he thought he thought Chaplin was a kind of a strange guy but they were friendly in those early days They'd go out to dinner and talk about movies and comedy. And, of course, uh, Chaplin would uh, recommend some of his fellow actors, comedians, and they'd talk about gags. Yeah, they had quite an association. As far as Buster Keaton, uh, that was late. That was 1955 when Keaton appeared in one of the television episodes of the director's, I think it was called the Screen Director's Playhouse. Keaton actually played an old-time silent film comedian in an episode. The last time I visited, in 73, I said, are there any old-timers still around? And I remember he said, well, I had dinner with Billy Gilbert. Oh, no, he passed away. He goes, I don't think there's anyone left. Well, there really were at least uh, half a dozen people or a dozen. You know, there was Anita Garvin and there was Joe Cobb and there was Spanky was still around. And But You know, me, 20 years old, I didn't know where to do the research and uh, didn't think. When he told me there's no one left, I assumed that was the case. Martha Sleeper, she lived till 1983. Did anyone interview her? But I'll tell you, in 1975, I think it was, I found the name Gertrude Astor in the phone book. You remember her? Yes, yeah, yeah. One of the great wives, you know, come clean comes to mind. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. Well, I I'm called just... then, I and it and I was speaking to Gertrude Astor. Oh wow! Now I know in Randy's new book, which I highly recommend, that 2016 updated version, he, I think he mentions that uh, that Gertrude Astor ended up in the motion picture home. Well, maybe in her last, I think she died in '77, but in '75 she was still at her own home somewhere, I think, in Hollywood, because she told me, oh, I'm a bit out of breath. I said, what happened? She says, I was up on my roof checking the for repairs. So she climbed up on her own <laughs> roof at that age, okay? Brilliant. Oh, that's, a, that's a Laurel and Hardy sketch straight away, isn't it? Fantastic. But at, at you know, at Hal Roach's funeral, of course, uh, last time I saw him was in May of 1992, and he was doing pretty damn good. I was very impressed with how he was. So we had a lovely get together, and then Richard Band did did arrive. I met him for the first time. Now uh, Hal Roach never mentioned this man to me in all the years I knew him, but there he was. I just knew him as the author of a book on uh, our gang and whatnot. And uh, he later did so much to restore the films, and he's done a great amount. And he would escort Hal Roach to all sorts of events. I'm glad he had someone to do that. Uh, well, he showed up, and he. A nice picture of Hal Roach and myself. Oh, yes, that's in your book as well, isn't it? Yeah, it's in my book, yes. Yes, yeah. He went to the July Sons of the Desert convention in Las Vegas that year. He went to Germany. He he just lived it up the last year of his life, I'll tell you. And even at 96, he said to me, do you realize in four years I'll be 100 years old? And I said, I know you'll make it, Mr. Roach. So every birthday I would call him. Wish him a happy birthday, and he he would always say, do you realize in three years I'll be 100 years old? I know you'll make it, Mr. Roach, (laughs) next year. Do you realize in two years I'll be 100 years old? I know you'll make it. Well, and then that day in 1992, and I wished him a happy birthday, and he says, do you realize I'm 100 years old? (laughs) He made it. And I said, I knew you'd make it, Mr. Roach. That's got to be one of the greatest running gags of my life. So, Patrick, uh, let's make a a vow right now that if when we both reach 100 years old, we'll have another interview, huh? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Definitely. Definitely. Let's do it. Speaking of 100th anniversary, um, I want this very clear. Uh, In 2026, September 20th, that should be the 100th anniversary of the teaming of Laurel and Hardy. 
I found not only was Duck Soup, the first day of filming was September 20th, 1926. There's even a, a Hal Roach Studios publicity release from 1932 when they were at the height of their career there. Mm-hmm. It's, it actually states September 20, 1926 is the day Laurel and Hardy became a team. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if there's any doubt about it, they might say, oh, well, when, uh, when the second hundred years was released or, or maybe do detectives think they're wearing, but if you want to, I mean, let's face it. And then they experimented and weren't really a team for several shorts, but, but by uh, do detectives think uh, the second hundred years, the battle of the century, there they were. Okay. And they never went backwards. Yeah. So you so you, so to your mind, duck soup is the, is the one that's 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 when we're starting from that's your starting point i really yes i do because and that's verified by people at the hal roach studios themselves saying that yeah because i know uh and i think that's in randy's book as well the, the press sheet for the second hundred years makes a big point of saying new comedy team uh uncle oh yeah well kind of because stuff. because when they made duck soup that wasn't the plan really it was just another another let's try this let's team them but it, but uh, the actual uh, full blown publicity campaign to announce the team, and I found the very first motion picture in print in one of the motion picture magazines. I believe it was September, yes, yeah, September 15, 1927. So this was a long time after Duck Soup. That was almost a year later, where they were finally being promoted as a new team. Right, okay. And what I'm trying to think what film that would be around then. It was either The Battle of the Century or The Second Hundred Years, where they really began the big push. And where and I have it detailed, I found all the telegrams uh between executives at the Roach Studios saying we've got to really push Laurel and Hardy, we've got to build them up as a team. That was all around the fall of twenty seven. And uh, don't forget their films. Like Sailors Beware was filmed in April of 27. That's right. Yeah. But it wasn't released until September, just before they were releasing uh, The Second Hundred Years and all that. So from, from actual production to release, there are sometimes several month gaps. That's right. That's why it yeah. makes it difficult to figure out, well, when did this happen? When did that? Randy did a fantastic job of, of detailing all of that. So I rely on, I rely, and I'm very happy that I found some documentation to help Randy in his research. That's great. And he thanks me in his big book. Uh, For example, you know, Busy Bodies, when that big saw cuts their uh, Model T in half? Yes. Uh, It had been said, well, that was a process shot. Well, it might have been partly a process shot, but there was an actual shot of them falling over in the in the two halves of the car. Oh, okay. All, Ollie got a serious injury to his shoulder. Oh, did he? Yes, I found the documentation from the hospital. Oh, wow. That corresponds to the exact day they were filming Busy Bodies. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah. Even though they had stunt doubles, they did a lot of the stuff themselves, you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, you can see. I, I like the story of um, in the Husko when Stan is supposed to uh, just slightly nick Babe between his legs with the pick. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> and it was oh. just slightly more than a, a Nick. <laughs> yeah, they really, gosh, they dedicated everything to to their comedies. I have one final question for you. Oh, really? Um, so soon? We could go on if you want. We, you well, know. we could go on. I'm sure Save we could. Save it for uh, yeah. something else. You know. I have two uh, two final questions for you, actually. The first question is uh, what I call the atoll question. Um, oh, so you yeah. are you are about to be marooned on a deserted atoll in the middle of the ocean. You're allowed to take four Laurel and Hardy related items with you, a silent short, talky short, and a feature, and a Laurel and Hardy book, not your own, although it is worthy. Uh, so which would you choose? And briefly well, that is so why. difficult, of course. It is. I know, of course. <laughs> so so let's, start, have... let's start with your silent short. Well, I'll, if I had to choose just one, I guess I'd have to say big business. Okay. For obvious reasons. Yeah. Okay, good. So an excellent selection, big business. And for your talky short? Well, I'm torn between several. I mean, I love so many of them, of course. But I sure got a kick out of the Spanish language politic, 
uh, how would you pronounce it? Politiquerias, which is the Spanish come home extended version. It is so, it's got all those crazy uh, little variety acts and whatnot. And that is the most bizarre speaking. section of film I think I've probably ever seen. The guy, the guy that keeps spitting the water out. Oh, I know. Isn't that, that is unbelievable? so surreal? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad it was filmed. And, poor, yeah, and of course, Jimmy Finlayson comes in and joins in, doesn't he, with it and gets yeah, soaked. and he gets, oh my <laughs> god, he gets the poor guy. Okay, so are you, are we saying political really Is that what we're? Um, well, I guess short? so. Just if I have to choose just one, now don't hold me to it. Next week, I might want to choose another fine mess or busy bodies is a classic. I just oh, love lovely. that one. Of course, yeah. the music box. I mean, there's so many. Yeah, that is, it's I, an impossible question. I, I mean, know. It, it's unfair. Features, of course, features, I'm always torn between Sons of the Desert and Way Out West. Yeah. To me, yeah. those are just the pinnacles of their feature films. But I'm very pleased. I really like Flying Do the Flying Deuces. Wow, okay. they maintained their quality and everything, and the, even the supporting cast, and it, it goes at a wonderful pace. And what, once you get a good print of it, it's a wonderful movie. Yeah, on oh, the recent blue. Have you have you seen the Blu-ray? The recent network Blu-ray. No, I I don't even own a Blu-ray machine. Can I can I get almost as good a quality if I looked at at it on a standard DVD? Uh, they I think Network did a DVD version as well. I mean, it won't be as good as the Blu-ray, but um, I'm sure it. Yeah. It, well, maybe I'll have to break a, down and get that equipment here. Uh yeah. It's it's not they're not that expensive nowadays, Greg. It's well worth it. Oh, okay. So, if I have to choose between those two, well, let's say Sons of the Desert, okay. Nice pick. And nice the book, pick. you know, and the book. aside from my own, I, it would have to be Randy's revised and expanded ultimate third edition. Of course. Of Laurel and Hardy, The Magic Behind the Movies. Yeah, it is a, that is a wonderful book. Mm-hmm. It is a wonderful book. But can Brilliant. I plug one other book I discovered? You're not going to believe this. Yeah. Uh, where is it? Oh, good Lord. You know, I attended... Mr. Roach's funeral in November of 1992. And I am so, the one regret I have is I didn't bring my camera. I didn't think it would be appropriate to bring a camera to a funeral, you know. But, but so many of the surviving our gang kids were there. So, oh, what I wanted to say was sitting behind me was Joe Cobb and a tall Indian looking gentleman in a turban. And this gentleman told me that he was the last person to see Hal Roach alive. I said, really? Well, he says, I am his next door neighbor. And years later, I was looking on Amazon.com. There is another book about Hal Roach. I want to mention this. It's called Hollywood Pioneer, The Life and Times of Hal Roach. The author's name, let me spell it out. First name, Harjinder, H-A-R-J-I-N. D as in David E-R. His last name is Singh, S-I-N-G-H. And he's indeed a Sikh. And of course, this must be the man that I met at the funeral. He published a book in 2016. It's it's quite a book. But anyway, he also has his personal spin on knowing Hal Roach. And he has a lot of amazing things. I don't think I even want to go into them here. I want to confer with Mr. Ban. How much of this could be true? He says certain things. like He was married to another woman that's never been discussed. He talks about so many different things that I'd never heard about. And he describes things that I wouldn't know. No one would know. Only he would know if it's true or not about his his friendship with Hal Roach. So I suggest people want to, if they're curious, to read his book as well. Yeah, brilliant, Craig. Thank you ever so much. It's been an absolute blast talking to you today. I, I mean, and I do feel like you know I know a lot more about Hal Roach now and and what kind of a guy he was. So thank you so much for filling that blank in for me. Oh, you're uh, very welcome. Thank you for and I, inviting. And I look me. forward to uh, I look forward to reading the rest of your book, um, especially the the May Bush part as well. I shall be thumbing through for that part <laughs> very very quickly. There are a lot of surprises in there. Let me tell you. So if you yeah. anytime you want another interview, just let me know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you've dangled many carrots now. I think we'll all be reaching for the book. And there will be, yeah, as I said, there'll be uh, links to uh, to buy your book in the show notes and also on the, the Laurel and Hardy blog website. So oh, thank you so much for joining us. It's been wonderful. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we'll speak to you soon. Look forward to it. Thank you so much, Patrick. Best of luck thank, to you. Thank you, Craig. Bye-bye. Gee, he sure is a swell guy, isn't he? He certainly is. I knew it the minute I set eyes on him.
did. Yeah, that's one thing I pride myself on, is reading character. Is that so? Yeah. As I just mentioned, you can pick up a copy of Craig's wonderful book, 100 Years of Brodies with Hal Roach, by clicking the link in the podcast show notes, or by visiting the shop page on the Laurel and Hardy blog website. Now, as I was preparing for this episode of the blogcast, I received an email informing me of an exciting new project that's happening right now. It's the production of a feature-length documentary about Hal Roach's life and career, and as the timing for this episode was perfect... I had to follow it up, so I immediately got in touch with the producer, James Forsher, and here's James to tell us more about what he's got planned. Hello? Just a minute, my friend Mr. Hardy will speak to you. Hello? Uh, excuse me, please, my ear is full of milk. Uh, my second guest today is James Forsher. James has been producing documentaries on Hollywood history for the past two decades. His films have appeared on the Discovery Channel, Cinemax, the Movie Channel and the Arts and Entertainment Network. And in 2019, he won the Broadcast Historian Award by the Library of American Broadcasting Foundation for his documentary, Roddenberry's Trek. I've invited James onto the show today as his latest project is the production of a feature-length documentary entitled The Hal Roach Story, which aims to explore the life and career of Hal Roach. So it's with great pleasure and interest that I say, James, welcome to the Laurel and Hardy blogcast. Well, I'm really glad to be here. Thanks, Patrick. It's an absolute pleasure. Um, yes, as I say, with great interest um, that I'm, I'm welcoming you on because this project does sound really tasty. Um, before we get into that, um, as I always do with my guest, James, I'd just like to know, um, how did you get interested in Laurel and Hardy and, and I guess in the Roach Studios? Okay. Laurel and Hardy and the Little Rascals, um, both of them are is something I grew up with in Los Angeles in the 50s and 60s, uh, a staple um, on afternoon television in weekend television was Laurel and Hardy uh, reruns. And uh, my brother and I were just avid Laurel and Hardy fans and couldn't get enough of them. Uh, so, you know, we just kind of, I just grew up with that. And to me, that was comedy. I mean, it was comedy timing. It was, it was the characters, you know, I really learned a lot about how um, comedy on, on films played out just watching these two over, over sure. years. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so a Hal Roach documentary, I mean, you know, that, that sounds like the ideal thing for, for listeners of this blogcast. Why did you decide to make a documentary about Hal Roach, James? Well, you know, it's just fortune, I guess. In some sense, it started as fortune, at least. Uh, back in the mid-1980s, uh, my production partner, Mark Wanamaker, who owns Bison Archives, and I got together and uh, we were working on a, a feature documentary about uh, kind of the, the birth of Hollywood. And... Um, he knew Hal, and so I. He says, "Well, why don't we interview Hal for the documentary?" And I said, "Sounds good. Let's do it." Um, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm a lifelong Hal Roach fan, so we had the good fortune of interviewing not just once but twice um, up in his house, and I mean, it was amazing. He was in his mid nineties at the time, uh, and I still remember at the interview he was pitching me. Um, I think Laurel and Hardy, uh, an update redo, and he just thought it would still do very well. <laughs> Fantastic. What a guy. Um, so, and uh, can you just give us your take on Hal Roach? How, how did you find him as a person and, you know, um, about just about his, his story in general? You know, what, what, what's your take on Hal Roach? Well, one word is amazing. I mean, to sit there in the mid-90s, this is a guy I'm sure drank, you know, and smoked cigars. And I mean, it, it wasn't like he was living a healthy life, uh, but he was very healthy and very funny, had a, had a good sense of wit. Um, and uh, I think um, very, very aware of how Hollywood worked. Uh, and in his mid nineties was able in a very clear way to kind of not only talk about his career, but how his career fit within Hollywood in general and in films and film development. Yeah, yeah, sure. That's brilliant. And um, and because, of course, he had a, um, well, one hell of a life. I mean, he lived to 100 years old. Yeah. Um, what, what are the sort of the, the, the pick-out moments of his career, do you think, just in a, in a kind of a nutshell about Hal Roach? You know, what, what ins sort of inspires you to think that this is a story that's worth telling? Um, I found... Um just listening to him talk that there was kind of an interesting hero's journey he went on, meaning that here's a guy that was looking for 
something special. And um, he started off, I think he went to Alaska uh, and then he came back and he thought he was going to be an actor. And I mean, he kept falling into these um, attempts that kind of directed him towards what he ended up doing fairly early on, which was by the late teens um, starting his own studio. And, you know, it takes a special person to say, well, I'm going to create my own studio, but, but he did it. And um uh, and it turned out to be one of the uh, best studios in Hollywood um, during the 20s and 30s. Um, and these were, you know, tough times. I mean, he started studio during the time when the studio system began. And so um, he had a small studio, but it was a, it was a very active studio across from MGM. And, uh, and he kept going and kept alive uh, for well over two decades. That's a long, long stretch for a studio. It is, absolutely. And, and of course, one of the first studios to convert to sound um, recording as well. Um, and also, you know, when you look at the phonetic uh, versions of the films that they made as well, you know, they were quite, uh, well, they were amazing, really. And uh, and I think one of the reasons they stopped doing it is because M- they were showing up the big boys, you know, MGM, they were overdubbing theirs, you know, and, and Hal was at the forefront of everything, wasn't he? Fabulous. So, okay, um, let us know about your project, James, because this it really does sound like an exciting uh, thing for all Laurel and Hardy fans and Roach Studio fans in general. You know, let's uh, let's let's hear about it. What's what's what have we got well, in store? What Mark and I uh, did when we talked with him was kind of get to uh, the backbone of of how he developed the studio. How during our interview was very open about um, how he proceeded in his career. And that meant telling us stories about um, Laurel and Hardy, what they were like to work with, um, how he put them together. Um, he, he told us a story about the Little Rascals, about how he was looking out the window one day at his um, studio and he saw some kids playing and he kind of got glued to watching them. And next thing you know, that was the inspiration. Of why not do a whole series with kids like that? So it's the type of thing where we really got the inside scoop of how he proceeded to. Uh, move over those um, years. And um, then um, luckily over the next few years on different projects we worked on, uh, we were able to interview people who were tied to uh, Roach's story. So uh, Jackie Cooper hosted a bunch of shows I did over the years and, uh, and he started off, um, you know, his little Jackie. Yes. Um, yeah. And so um, I interviewed um Spanky uh, McFarland um, for a series I did for Discovery Channel called uh, Hollywood Chronicles. And, you know, that that was kind of an amazing, because he kind of, there he was kind of probably 70, I don't know, and and he kind of looked like a miniature Spanky. It was was just interesting. So we we got all these different interviews, um, interviewed um, uh, Rob Ward, who's a producer who actually was living in Hal Roach's house in in Hollywood. And, uh, um, different parts of Hal's life came together with all the different interviews we had been doing throughout the years. And so about, I don't know, four or five years ago, um, Mark and I said, let's, we've been talking about it. Let's just do it. So uh, uh, Mark Wanamaker has the Bison archives. And so he has thousands of of behind the scenes stills, um, many of which have never been seen of that period. Yeah. And I've been collecting all the films and the interviews. So, um, yeah, it's just it's one of these things that took way too long to put together, but we're now at the uh, final stretch. Yeah, sounds like it'll be worth a wait, though. It just sounds like it's really... Well, you know, I mean, it's a great way to spend one's COVID moments inside. <laughs> That's true, very true. Uh, and what about, I know, um, you know, a lot of your uh, career, James, is about... Um, you've written a book on stock footage and uh, about having different um, bits of film to insert into documentaries. What, you know, have you got... Because the documentaries that we've seen in the past about Roach Studios, you know, they have, you know, sort of similar clips that that are public domain. Uh, Have you got access to more clips of films or, you know, what's your additional footage going to be like? Um, Well, we have a lot of behind the scenes material. And so that's makes it a little different than the, you know, the routine public domain clips. So um, all the films I've done throughout the years, um, I've gone on treasure hunts for footage. Yeah, because I knew, you know, you can't just keep showing the same clip over and over again. Yes. So between Mark and I and the collectors we know, we were able to find material that that was just a little out of the ordinary. And oh, uh, right. 
So yeah, we, we I, I kind of somewhat can guarantee that it just will not be a clip show full of public domain footage. No, that sounds brilliant. That's that would bore me, and I, <laughs> I mean, I have to spend months making it. I mean, you know, of so no. That's true. So as a fan, this is something that you would, you know, you would want to watch yourself. That's the, I suppose that's what we're trying to do, isn't it? Got to be special. Yes. It's got to really yeah. pay. Uh, uh, um, it's a homage to an amazing man. And so the documentary can't be anything less than that. And um, otherwise we wouldn't do it. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, you could sit there and say, do Spielberg. Well, fine, but I can't do Spielberg because I don't have access to all the stuff it would take plus a million dollar budget to make that work. Yeah, that's very true. Very true. Um, so is there any way that people can find out more about the project? Any way that, you know, you could, we could support the project? Sure. Um, yeah, I just, I'm, we're looking for just some very minimal uh, support. And so all you have to do is go to Indie, I-N-D-I-E, go, go, Indiegogo.com. <clears throat> okay. Type in Hal Roach. It'll take you right to the project. And uh, we're looking for a very nominal amount. We've already raised 25% of what we're, you know, hoping Fantastic. for. Brilliant. Um, this money goes for <clears throat> basically the final <clears throat> elements I can't do, which is like the sound design, some graphics. Um, that's it. I mean, everything else we, we've taken care of. 97% of the project's uh, good. This is that last few hundred dollars that... Um, I'll call in some favors and but I, I, I believe in paying people something. Yeah. So um, that's what this is about. And so um, also, by the way, anyone that, you know, um, goes to the site and supports it, they can get a DVD signed. They can get a poster. They can get a T-shirt. I mean, there, there are a bunch of little premiums. Um, but most important for me, um, I take it, we got Hal uh, Roach fans. We've got Laurel and Hardy fans. Who have their own knowledge base and so they everyone who signs up becomes an advisor to the show oh great and so you'll be getting weekly updates and questions that maybe you guys um out there can help us with wonderful that's really good really really good well, i look forward to seeing it it looks it sounds fantastic so have you got any idea in time since at time scale i mean obviously i guess it's a funding issue but um what would you estimate well, we're, you know, this is uh, maybe three weeks left to, to do this. Um, and we're, um, and I'll start editing right away. I mean, as soon as we see what we get, I'll know what I can kind of finish the project with. And probably three months um, before we get a rough cut. And um, what people who sign up for the project will get is um, rough cuts as they go, meaning they'll get an access to a site where I'll keep posting the latest updates and then hopefully asking for feedback. So you get the first rough cut, take a look at it, write me back. I hate it. This is why, or, you know, <laughs> I can't stay in the middle intense, you know, middle park because it helps me quite a bit. So you guys will be part of the production crew. You'll be actually given a credit for that. Um, and then um, once that rough cut, like I say, about three months from now, is finished it gets uh, submitted to my distributor and uh, it goes from there that's fun it's an excellent opportunity to be, to be a part of something uh, yeah very special wonderful uh james that's fantastic thank you ever so much um sure. i'll make sure there are links in the show notes and also on the, the laurel and hardy blog website uh, which link into your site so people can check that out and uh, hopefully we can support it the rest of the way for you that'd be wonderful i would love it i really appreciate it no problem at all. Thanks ever so much. Thanks for coming on. Thanks, Patrick. And I'm afraid that's about it for episode five. Have you anything else to say? Well, no. That's all there is. There isn't any more. Is there, Stanley? No, that that's our story and we're stuck with it. In it. Thanks again to our guests, Craig Kalman and James Forsher. For more information about them and their work, check out the links in the show notes and on the Laurel and Hardy blog website. Thanks as usual to all the authors whose work I've consulted in writing my blogs and preparing these episodes, including Dave Lord Heath. Particularly huge thanks go to Randy Scretvert and Glenn Mitchell, whose books I use on a daily basis and I highly recommend. 
Both Randy and Glenn have actually agreed to join us on future episodes, so do watch this space for those. Massive thanks must go, of course, to the Bohunks Orchestra, as usual, for their glorious music, and links to buy their CDs can again be found in the show notes and on the website. A thousand thanks. And don't forget, if you want to join in the discussions about this episode and the podcast series and also the Laurel and Hardy blogs that I write, why not join us at the Blockheads Facebook group? And so all that's left to bring episode five to a close is to say goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And goodbye from me. Goodbye. <laughs>